Hi everyone, this is Jessica Fern Cooley and I am going to be presenting on couples transitioning from monogamy to polyamory and doing their best to stay together. So this is a presentation and talk that I've been giving at several different conferences this year and similar to the trigger talk that I've been giving, um, people are asking for the slides, they'd like a recording of the talk, so I'm making it available to you. And I just want to give a shout out to the different conferences I have been at this year so far. Um, starting in early April, Southwest Love Fest, Kate Kincaid, Sarah Bachman Williams um, in Tucson, Arizona. In end of April, Rocky Mountain Poly Living by Robin Trask in Denver, Colorado. And then most recently, the Poly Dallas Millennium Conference by Ruby Johnson in Dallas, Texas. And so all of these conferences, they're very different. They each have different strengths. They've all had amazing presenters and are all doing their best to create more awareness and education and community and connection around um, consensual non-monogamy. So this talk sort of sprouted out of my experience, both professionally and personally. So professionally, I'm a psychotherapist and coach, and one of my specialties is working with non-monogamous folks. And then personally, I was non-monogamous for a period of time in adolescence and early 20s, and then I was monogamously married to my partner for years before the two of us transitioned into being poly. And so this talk sort of comes from both ends of my professional and personal life and what I've sort of seen that this transition is. And really, ideally, I think the therapy room um, is a place where people can really let their guard down and share openly and honestly and fully about themselves and their relationships. But all too often, when people start to bring up non-monogamy or poly to their therapist or to other healthcare professionals, or even just their friends and family members. They are met with criticism, with judgment. People are even pathologized. And then as a couple, what happens is all too often, there's this sort of stigma that goes along with couples transitioning out of monogamy that, you know, a couple going poly basically means you're just going to break up. And we hear this from friends and family and professionals as well. And I think this you know, cliche in a way really can silence people who actually do need help, right? They do need support in this transition. The other thing I think that a lot of people hear is that, you know, poly is just, this whole poly thing seems way too hard. Maybe you should just go back to monogamy. This is the advice that, again, both friends, family, and professionals give. Now, in terms of telling people who are struggling with the transition from monogamy to poly, whether you're a couple or not, right, but anyone who's struggling with that transition, to tell them to just go back to monogamy because poly seems too hard, to me, this would be like telling new parents who are struggling with the realities and difficulties of no sleep, no time for self-care, no time for a shower in the last week, no time for each other as a couple, you know, that maybe this whole like kids thing seems way too difficult, this parenting thing seems way too hard, maybe you should just send the kids back. <laughs> It's silly, right? It's ridiculous um, because we know better. We know that even though people choose to step into parenthood, they choose to make a transition in their life, a big one, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be easy and it might go on for a while and we would never then point our finger when there's struggle with that transition at the children and say, you know, that's the new thing, that, so therefore that's the cause, that's the problem, and that's what should be eradicated. But people don't necessarily know better, even professionals, when it comes to non-monogamy, and they are more than quick on the draw to point the finger and say, well, this is the new thing you're doing, so that must be the cause, that must be the problem, therefore just press that delete button on poly and just backspace into monogamy as if it was that simple. In terms of this other thing where, you know, the idea that couples going poly inevitably leads to breakup, let's be honest, we've all seen it, right? There's some truth to it that many couples do try to be non-monogamous and they do break up. 
But from my perspective, it's not because of polyamory itself that's the problem and the cause. But instead, I think it's the experience of going through a major paradigm shift. And this is what is creating so much difficulty and tumult. So from my perspective, polyamory is not the cause of relationship challenges or breakups. It's the shift into a different paradigm of relationship. That is, right? And so what happens in this paradigm shift that a couple is making from monogamy to polyamory, what I've seen is it will either expose all of the things in the monogamous relationship that weren't really working anyway, and we're probably going to break this couple up anyway, but that transition just expedites the whole process. Or what I see is that the transition and the difficulty people are experiencing has nothing to do with their monogamous relationship. They might have had a wonderful monogamous relationship, but the paradigm shift itself can be so massive, um, so tumultuous, so transformative that not every couple makes it through it together. And often because there isn't the right support available to them, there isn't the right perspective. So I just want to define paradigm. So we're all on the same page because I will use it again. So the word paradigm, um, the phrase came from Thomas Kuhn in the 1960s. And originally he was talking about paradigms in science. So if you have the same data, the way that a biologist looks at it compared to a chemist or a physicist, they will look at the same data and have completely different interpretations of what that data means, right? They have completely different paradigms of understanding the world. And so a paradigm is a way of organizing and understanding reality based on a certain set of ideas, beliefs, and assumptions about how things are supposed to be. So it's now become more of a general term that's a synonym for our worldview or the lens or frame through which we are seeing and experiencing the world. And so a dominant paradigm would be the main values, the main ways of being, or the systems of thought in a society that are standard, widely held, and often taken for granted. So usually our dominant paradigms are invisible, especially to those of us that are living in the dominant paradigm, right? They can be painfully visible for those of us that do not exist in the dominant paradigm. So today in the U.S., the dominant paradigms of our culture would be um, middle class, white, heterosexual, monogamous, male, um, democratic or republican, being Christian, and so on. And so a paradigm shift is a significant change in your beliefs or ways of thinking about experiencing and perceiving reality. So obviously in this talk, I'm talking about that paradigm shift from monogamy to polyamory. And then paradigm shock is something I see often in this transition that people make, which is similar to culture shock. And it's the experience of difficulty or disorientation from being in an unfamiliar paradigm that has a different set of values, expectations, attitudes, and ways of being. So even though someone might choose to shift into a different paradigm, there can still be paradigm shock. So even if it's a paradigm that ultimately you feel like resonates more with you and fits you in your life better, there can still be paradigm shock in that transition. And so going from monogamy to polyamory means that people are taking on a massive shift in worldview through living in a different paradigm of relationship, where now almost every aspect of love, romance, sex, partnership, and even family are all defined differently. And they all have now a different set of values, expectations, attitudes, and ways of being. And so even though non-monogamy is on the rise and not the awareness of non-monogamy is really increasing, for the most part, though, people are stepping into a paradigm of relationship that is still mostly misunderstood. It is still feared and it is still stigmatized. And so this can be difficult. Now, this to me is difficult whether you are um, coupled or not making this transition. 
However, I do think it's more difficult to do as a couple and to try to stay together because you are going through a multi-level process. So on the individual level, right, the, the person, one partner is deconstructing monogamy for yourself with all of those ingrained beliefs and habits and behaviors that you might have been doing for your entire life. And then the other partner is having their own deconstruction process of monogamy and what that's looked like and what hooks in them have are still at play, right? Which might be different for each partner. And now you have the relationship level, right? Where you're trying to deconstruct and then reprogram with someone else. And it's not just anybody else because it is easier to come together with someone where you're both already non-monogamous or poly, right? In this case, you're having to redo this with someone that you've potentially had years of shared monogamous patterning with, years of shared monogamous identity and experience with this person, and you're trying to create something new together. And so it can be a very tall order for couples. Now, in terms of the resources that are out there for couples, um, there's some wonderful resources, and I think they usually focus, rightfully so, on how you come up with your own version, right? What's your version of poly look like? Um, how do you make agreements together? How do you communicate better? How do you manage jealousy? These are foundational topics, and it's usually what I hear when couples call me. So couples will call and say, we need to come in because or we're needing support because we have broken agreements that we need to figure out or we're fighting more and having all of these communication difficulties now that we're poly and um, or one of us is really struggling with jealousy. But what's interesting is as we get several sessions in, what I see is that a lot of these things around jealousy, agreements, or communication and fighting are often symptoms, right? And they're symptoms of this paradigm shift of what I'll be focusing on today. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to go through these five things. I'll be talking about resistance to the paradigm shift itself, Relationship skills from monogamy do not always convert. There are individual differences between partners that can get exposed. It can catalyze a personal awakening or crisis of the authentic self. And it can initiate a crisis of insecure attachment. And so just a caveat here is I am sort of talking about this through the lens of the couple. But these five things I've seen apply not just to the couple, I've seen them apply to the individual, as well as people who are already further along in their transition, you know, maybe even years down the road, already doing poly, have a polycule in a triad, in a quad, um, but there's different initiations that can happen to people along the way, like the first time your partner actually falls in love with someone else, and that might take a year or two before that happens, um, or the first time that someone wants to move in with somebody else, and so I've seen some of these things show up as well. All right, let's take a sip of water and dive in. So the first thing is resistance to the paradigm shift itself. I see this summed up as hearing a couple say, we want to be poly now, but we don't want our relationship to actually change. <laughs> so couples want their relationship structure to change, but then you don't want the relationship itself to actually change. And that's not really possible. Going from monogamy to polyamory is not like building an addition onto your house where you just build out another room, which then increases the value of your original home. Going from monogamy to poly isn't an add-on to your original relationship where everything gets to stay as it is, and then there's just this added perk of we have some more partners too. Going from monogamy to polyamory is a transformation of the relationship which can look like a massive renovation of the house that you, you have lived in. And sometimes it looks like a complete demolition of the house and something completely new has to be built from the ground up. Because when you change your relationship paradigm, it does mean that you are going to change, your partner's going to change, and the relationship is going to change. Now, for those of you that don't like the word change, 
I know people sometimes have resistance to the idea of change or that they're expected to change, then it's important to use synonyms that work for you, right? That this is about learning, this is about growing, this is about the newness that comes through being on a different journey together. And I would never fault anyone or any couple for wanting to preserve your relationship. Like, of course, there are many things that you want to hold on to together that you don't want to lose, that you cherish, right? There's some important pieces of art and furniture from your old place that you're still going to want to put up in your new place, right? There are things from your history together that can never be erased. And there are aspects of the uniqueness of your connection that will not be replaced by new partners coming in. And a lot of times in my coaching and therapy, I really help and focus with couples on really naming a lot of those things um, that you cherish together that cannot be lost. However, the way that you function and the way that you relate, especially the ways that you function and relate that have been rooted in monogamous behaviors, that does need to change, right? in order for this paradigm shift to be successful. And I see that it's the resistance to the change through trying to keep things the same or trying to promise each other that things will always be the same, that this actually becomes the static that gets in the way of the very relationship that you're actually trying to preserve, okay? So my own personal example of resistance to the transition comes from giving birth. So almost four years ago, I was in labor giving birth to my son. And as you probably know, in order for a baby to come out of a female body, the cervix has to dilate from being closed, which is zero centimeters, and it has to dilate to 10 centimeters so that the baby can move through the birth canal. And so that last few centimeters, the 8, 9, 10 centimeters of dilation, this is medically called transition. And it's known to be one of the most excruciating times in labor. And for me, it was. (laughs) Like I had known pain before and I, this was completely unbearable. And so naturally I was doing things like shifting my position and moving around to try to make myself more comfortable, to try to ease the pain. And my midwife saw this and she says, Jessica, by trying to make yourself more comfortable and ease the pain, you're actually resisting the transition. And by resisting the transition, you're stalling your labor. And in my case, I was having a unique birth where my baby was butt first, he was breech. And so stalling my labor meant that I was then subject to potential interventions that I didn't want to have unless they were true medical necessities. So my midwife said, you got to stand up physically and metaphorically, like stand up so that I can, my body can have the benefit of gravity to support me. But I also needed to stand up to the transition itself. And so I did, I stood up and the pain actually got worse. However, I was no longer in resistance to the transition. I was in surrender to the pain, to what was needing to happen. And my body opened up. He was able to be born in the way that I wanted him to be born. So while I don't necessarily always tell people this story, it's a metaphor that I will use of of what is the new relationship that you are giving birth to as a couple and even seeing that there are going to be periods of time where there is painful contractions that you're going through, but those are really in support of pushing through and giving birth to this new relationship. So it's important to be aware of any resistance to change that you might be having or your partner might be having, whether it's resistance to the change of the relationship or one of you changing and growing or behaving in new ways. And ideally to accept and embrace that change is inevitable and it's actually a good thing that you're going through. So the next thing I see is that going from monogamy to polyamory, relationship skills from monogamy do not always convert. So there's some really good advice, some sound wisdom in the poly world that really warns couples away from using polyamory to fix their relationships and really advises couples to usually wait until you're in a more healthy, stable place before you embark on your non-monogamy journey together. For the most part, I agree with this advice. Um, I do see it as useful. I am, however, seeing times when polyamory actually does fix a relationship, but that you can email me about if you want to talk about it. 
So for the most part, though, I do agree with this. But what I don't see or hear talked about as much is that what could have looked perfectly functional and healthy in monogamy does not always translate to what is then functional and healthy in non-monogamy. So what works in one relationship structure does not necessarily hold up in a different relationship structure. And I see this like the conversion of money from one currency to another, where the U.S. dollar does not have the same value depending on the exchange rate of which country we are traveling to. So as Americans, we usually benefit from the exchange rate. So a dozen years ago, I was in Thailand. I wanted to go from the south part of the country to the north. And the cheapest way for me to do that was to take a round trip plane ticket that was only 40 American dollars. Now, in a similar time period, I was in Switzerland and I sat down, I had lunch, I got a sandwich and a cup of coffee and this little cookie. And then I get the bill and that was 40 American dollars. So the way I see it is that going poly in a lot of ways can be like going to Europe where everything is just a bit more expensive because one American dollar is only 0.8 euros. And so 100% of the skills that you use to keep your relationships functional and healthy and afloat in monogamy might only convert to 60, 70, 80% of the skills that you need to keep your relationship functional, and to be thriving in polyamory. And this is what I hear from clients where, as I said, they call saying we're fighting more and having all these communication challenges. And I'll always say, okay, you're fighting more since you went poly, but did the communication challenges also start with poly? And they always say, oh, no, no, no. We've had these communication challenges since the beginning. But we were mostly able to manage them together. But now that we're poly, there's just too many moving parts. There's too many emotions. There's too many other people and their emotions. There's too many logistics. There's too many calendars. Right? There's too many conversations that um, we never even had to have. Or in monogamy, we only had to have once. And then we were done with that conversation. And we're having to have them over and over again with each other and with new partners. And we are sinking. We are totally sinking. So from my perspective, it's important that you have the awareness of the gap between the skills that a couple or a partner had in monogamy versus the ones that you now need in poly and to see that it's not poly itself that is causing now all the additional fighting but it can be this issue of conversion around your skills so to focus ideally on acquiring new skills and or up leveling the skills that you already have and to be patient with each other in this process is important because you're already going through this massive transition and now you're having multiple relationships and now you're now on top of that having to go through a boot camp in communication and relationship skills. It can be a lot. Okay, the next thing is that going from monogamy to polyamory can expose individual differences between partners. So I'll briefly name the first two that I see. The first one is personality differences. The most common one I hear about is the difference between introversion, a partner who sees themselves as more introverted versus one who is more extroverted. And then differences in individual pacing. So what I mean by individual pacing is that we all have different speeds at which we process information. So how fast or slow we make a decision, how fast or slow we can put a thought together, how fast or slow we can cool down after getting upset or even how fast we do get upset. Um, then when we go poly, how fast or slow you fall in love with someone else or want to get into a relationship with them or want to have sex with them. Now in monogamy, you'll hear, you know, partners really do know about these differences. They will refer to them and they'll talk about, you know, oh yeah, we're very different in these ways, but we complement each other. Um, we make it a compatibility thing or we balance each other out. They will talk about it as an asset or a strength. And sometimes those remain assets or strengths, but I've also seen that sometimes the same things that worked before, those differences can become a lot further apart and a lot bigger and it can become more difficult to bridge once a couple goes from monogamy to polyamory. The one I want to focus on is what I'm calling the difference between a partner who is more poly as lifestyle versus a partner who is more poly as orientation. 
So if we look at this, the spectrum of romantic relationships, on one end we have monogamy, on the other end there's polyamory. Now I don't think that any points on the spectrum are static. People can move to different points throughout their life and based on their experiences and preferences. But people who are more on the ends of the spectrum, usually they refer to it as more of an orientation, something that feels really um, foundational to who they are, something they feel like this is what I'm wired to be. And then there's people who are more in the middle, and they tend to talk about monogamy or poly as, you know, it's something that can come or go, it's something that they can take or leave, it might change depending on where they are in their life, what they're needing at a certain point in life, um, or which partner they are with. And so there are a lot of resources out there already on the pairing of someone who is more monogamous with someone who is more poly, so these sort of far ends of the spectrum. The one I want to look at is this pairing between a partner who is more poly as lifestyle choice with someone who is more poly as orientation. So someone who's more poly as lifestyle, they agree with and believe in poly from an ethical, philosophical, or feminist perspective. And so usually they really stand behind it as the lifestyle that they choose. They feel good about it. They feel proud about it. Someone who's more poly is orientation, they of course also agree with and believe in poly from an ethical, philosophical, or feminist perspective. However, for them it doesn't necessarily feel like a choice. It feels more like this is who I am. This is the fullest expression of me. Now, a poly is lifestyle person, for many times, they would not necessarily initiate going poly on their own, and they will usually see it as more of an experiment, and you'll hear this in the language, like, hey, yeah, we're trying this out, we're going to give it a go, we're going to see if it works, and in the back of their mind, they're like, great, and if it doesn't work, we can always go back to monogamy. For someone who's more poly as orientation, once poly is initiated, it can be like a coming out process with no going back. So in the same way when someone realizes that they are gay, bi, lesbian, trans, like I am now the butterfly that cannot go back through the chrysalis, right? This is a permanent shift that's happened in me. So it can really be like a coming out process with no going back for people. And so because of this, usually this partner has a faster pace. There's usually a lot of excitement, a lot of zeal that happens. You know, they'll read the word polyamory in a book and realize, oh my goodness, this is me, right? All these years, this is actually what feels most true to me. And when they realize this and are ready to go there with their partner, they want to take off like a rocket ship. Whereas the poly as lifestyle person will usually have a slower pace, not because they are slower and not because they're trying to be difficult for their poly as orientation partner, right? But because they're located on the spectrum, physically closer to monogamy, right? So there's still things about monogamy that they might agree with, that they might want, that they might still really cherish. So this partner will usually have more questions and doubts about, can I do this? Do I want to do this? Am I capable of doing this? Like they don't fully know. And for them, usually they feel like they're actually going as fast as they can every day. They are stretching beyond their limit and their ability. Whereas for their poly's orientation partner, they feel feel like they are being endlessly patient. We're not moving forward because when you are ready to take off like a rocket ship, it is a Herculean effort to try to slow that rocket ship down, right? So each partner in this pairing is interpreting the other one through their own position on the spectrum. And so because of that, they're each feeling unseen and usually misunderstood and even hopeless about how are we going to make this work. So the way that I work with this is first just being aware of the difference in position so that each of you can better see and hold space for each other, right? So that you can see that your partner's behavior has more to do with their location on the spectrum opposed to it being something personal to you, right? And you interpreting your partner as not loving you or not wanting to you to be who you are, right? Whatever that is. So just this, even literally I will draw this out for clients and it can make a difference just to see where each partner is located. More specifically though, the poly is lifestyle partner usually needs the space 
to have and express their doubts and their fears about going poly. So suppressing doubts and fears and concerns usually doesn't work. And a lot of times for these people, fake it till you make it does not work either. It does not work all the time. And so they really need to be able to share with others, but also with their partner, their uncertainty and to ask for reassurance. Now, what I do with the poly is orientation partners, then they usually need to be coached on how to hold space for their partner's doubts and not shut them down, right? And then not freak out themselves. So every time their poly's lifestyle partner has some doubts that they go into a freak out because I call this the Sophie's Choice Trigger and they need to learn how to manage the Sophie's Choice Trigger. So for those of you that don't know, that's a movie from the early 80s with Meryl Streep. And her character is a Polish woman who arrives at the concentration camps in World War II. And she has a son and a daughter. And she's given a choice of which, of which child will live and which child will die. And so this is an impossible choice. And so the phrase Sophie's Choice has become synonymous for any impossible choice that we have, that we are given that doesn't really feel like a choice. So what happens for the poly as orientation partner that I see is that when their poly as lifestyle partner starts to express the doubts and starts to say, I, I don't know if I want to do this. Can we just go back to monogamy? This feels really difficult. Um, how are we going to make this work? The poly as orientation partner is faced with this dilemma of, wait, wait a minute. If you can't actually do this, then I either have to decide to break up with you, which I might want to keep spending the rest of my life with you, right, in order to be true to myself. Or I have to shut myself down so that I can stay with you. Right? And it feels like an impossible choice. And that's often why it's that sense of overwhelm that they start to try to shut down and minimize or dismiss their poly's lifestyle partner when that person is in their own struggle and difficulty. And so we really work with how do you come to the edge of the difficulty of that moment without jumping over the cliff every time a partner is struggling. Now, for the poly as orientation person, they usually need to be seen for this as being an orientation that they are not, that to them might not feel like a choice. Um, and then e even though it might feel more natural to them, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy for them either. And so this I find is what I'll do is I'll coach the poly as lifestyle partner to connect with something in their own life that feels so essential to who they are and their well-being and how needing that specific thing actually has nothing personal to do with their partner, right? That they could love their partner and still fully also need this other thing. And when that person can connect with what that is or looks like in their own life, they're usually better able to start seeing their poly as orientation partner. And then finally, what I'll do is I'll coach each, the whole couple, in creating the distinction between where are we now versus where are we headed. So if when this pairing, it's very difficult to say we're going to be poly tomorrow and we're just going to do kitchen table poly, right? So it's helpful usually to say, okay, we're in a certain season. We're in a transition. The transition might go on for a bit, um, but this is where we are at the moment. And this is what we're needing. And this allows the poly as lifestyle partner to sort of relax and rest a bit and not feel like they have to be pushing themselves beyond their limits every single day. However, it also creates the vision for the poly as orientation partner that it says we are, we are headed in this direction. These are the steps that we're taking. We are going to get there. Okay, so the next thing that going from monogamy to polyamory can do is it can catalyze an awakening or crisis of the authentic self or all of the ways that someone has potentially been inauthentic with who you are and how you've been showing up in relationships that can all get exposed. So I think I see this as there's a lot of things in life that we don't fully know until we do them. Right? There's a lot of things, lessons that um, we can't get until we go through the lesson. Of course, we want the lesson before we have to go through it. But there's a lot of things we can't even see about ourselves until we're in a new context. So for me, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, and midway through high school, I already knew I didn't want to stay in New York. I didn't fully know why, though. 
but I really wanted to go out west. And it wasn't until I was in my mid-20s that I got out to California and then landed in Colorado. And it wasn't until I was having this firsthand experience of the difference in the pace of life, the difference in the attitude of the people, really that open-mindedness and people prioritizing their physical and emotional and mental health in ways I just had never seen modeled for me in New York. And even the physical space was massive, like the big sky, which, you know, growing up in Brooklyn and in Manhattan, like there's slivers of sky between the skyscrapers or the apartment buildings where you don't even see the sky on some blocks, right? So it was in this other environment that I just felt so expansive that then I then had a comparison and I can look back and see, oh, wow, that person who I was in New York was really contracted, really shut down and protected and sort of more of this performance of who I thought I was supposed to be and more of a reaction to my environment instead of this alive, more authentic expression of who I felt myself to be. Right. So it wasn't until I had this actual contrast and was in a different context that a lot of parts of me even became accessible. And so I can see this And I do see this with monogamy where it's not until people step out of it and they start experiencing new and different parts of themselves come alive with new and different partners that they're then even able to look back and say, oh, wow, it wasn't that I was lying intentionally all those years, but that person who I was back there wasn't really an honest version of me. And it didn't really actually work for me, and it definitely does not continue to work for me to be that person. So what happens is there's this paradigm shift from monogamy to poly, And it can create this process of self-reflection and self-discovery because now that you're in a new paradigm, you're in a different perspective. You have a different viewpoint. You're able to see things that you didn't necessarily see before. And so new questions will arise. And so often people start asking, who is it that I've been all these years? And the answers are not necessarily easy to look at and to face, right? People will see, oh, wow, I've been really shut down. I've been closed off or I've been containing myself. I've been saying yes all these years when I've really been wanting to say no. I haven't been creating important boundaries for myself. I haven't been prioritizing my own opinions or preferences or dreams and desires. And so with that, people then usually ask, well, who is it that I want to be? Who is it that I want to become? And this is where that awakening of the authentic self or a more authentic self starts to come online, where more genuine, honest versions of you are asking to come forward. And I see this as a very important developmental process for many people in their life. The crisis can come in where if I actually become that person, will my partner still want to be with me? If I actually start setting healthy boundaries for myself, if I actually start to say no instead of always saying yes, if I actually start to prioritize certain things that are important to me, will my partner still love me? Will we still be compatible, right? And it can sort of bring the relationship into crisis. Now there's something else that I see happen with this. So there's this kind of level where people are doing the awakening of the self through questioning how, like, who is it that I've been? How have I been showing up in relationship? And then for some people that goes a step further where they're not just questioning, you know, who am I? How have I been showing up? But they also start questioning all of the other dominant ideas and dominant discourses that have been deeply internalized for us around race, class, gender, sexuality, individualism, patriarchy, capitalism, colonialism, like you name it, right? They start questioning it all. So as they're pulling apart the building blocks of their own personal identity, they then start pulling apart all of those building blocks of our societal and cultural norms. And as they're examining them brick by brick, it's sort of questioning like, well, what is this? Who said this is actually truth? Is this how I actually want to live my life? And so what can happen is it can create a crisis of deconstruction. 
To me, this is the personal crisis that occurs through questioning and deconstructing multiple aspects of your personal identity along with societal and cultural norms. So as people start to deconstruct everything about yourself and life and our culture, people can really collapse into the rubble where you're left in this place of like, I don't know what's up from down. I don't know what's right from wrong. I don't know, you know where I fit. I don't necessarily know how to function. Right? And in the therapy room, this can look like things like depression or nihilism or suicidal thoughts. I see it as being something that is uh, akin to a midlife crisis, a Saturn return process, a dark night of the soul process, a spiritual crisis even that people can go through. And so it's important to know that this can happen. Right? This might be something that you have gone through or one of your partners has gone through. It might be something that you're experiencing now. And to take it seriously. For many people, this is sometimes the biggest awakening or turning point um, in their life. Right, It can be very significant. But I see it as common and I see it as healthy. And I say this because I've seen the power and beauty of what can come through on the other side of this process. It's also important to know that it will pass. There isn't a quick fix on this one. Um, It might go on for a while, but you will shift out of it. And so with that, it's often important to allow the breakdown so that there can actually be a breakthrough. To reclaim the parts of you that have been lost or denied or exiled, right? So this is usually a process of reclaiming your power, your creativity, your sexuality, or or any other parts of you that haven't been fully allowed that you really need now with you to move forward with your life in a new way. It's also important to identify your own values and beliefs and principles that you want to live by. So I actually have people go through worksheets of starting to identify what are your values, what are your intentions for your relationships, for your life, instead of just defaulting to the cultural or societal values. If this is your partner, it's important to see the gravity of what this is and to as best as possible have patience and compassion for them. However, if this is if your partner is going through this, you also need support because they might not be able then to fully show up in the ways that you are used to, whether that's taking care of the home or the kids or finances, whatever it is. And so both of you will probably need support from family, from friends, from professionals, potentially from psychedelics. Okay, and last but not least, Going from monogamy to polyamory can initiate a change in attachment style. So as human infants, we come into this world with an attachment system that wires us to expect connection with others. Because we are not able to yet meet our own needs, we actually need to bond and attach with a caretaker in order to survive. And when I say needs, I don't just mean shelter and food, but actually the biological needs for emotional warmth, emotional attunement, and touch. And so the researchers and psychologists John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth, they showed that depending on how well our caretakers were able to respond to our needs and how well we were able to attach and bond with them, we each developed different attachment styles, which is either being more secure or insecurely attached. And then these early childhood attachment experiences become the blueprint for what we then go on to expect or even create in our adult relationships and usually we're talking about adult romantic intimate relationships so I'm going to quickly go through the attachment styles just so we're on the same page and then I'll talk about how that applies within poly so as an adult if you have more of a secure attachment style actually let me pause and just say that all of these styles none of them are static Research finds that all of these different styles can change. So if you are someone who grew up in an insecurely attached childhood experience, you can grow up to be an adult who has secure functioning in your relationship. So these do change. And there's even research that shows among adults, these styles, even the insecure ones can change where you can go from one insecure style to another, which I'll describe those in a moment. Okay. So the secure attachment style in an adult 
would look like having a more positive view of yourself as well as your partner, being more interdependent so you don't tend to be too independent or too dependent, but there's a sense of interdependence, being comfortable with emotional intimacy, being comfortable with closeness as well as separateness. So you can come together and feel like, I know how to do closeness. I really enjoy this. And then when we're separate, I might miss you, but I'm fundamentally okay with myself. There's a lot more trust and freedom. And this really does play out in non-monogamy where there's trust and freedom within our relationships um, to really feel secure and safe that our partners can explore love and romance and sex with other people. And usually you hear, hear someone say, my partner is there for me when I need them. Now, insecure attachment styles, there's three different ones. The first one we'll talk about is called avoidant or dismissive. And as an adult, this would tend to be someone who has a more positive view of themselves and more of a negative view of their partner or the other. And not because they're actually arrogant, right? If this is someone who came from an avoidant attachment in childhood, that attachment style was created because this person couldn't rely on, they couldn't actually depend on the caretakers in their life. Their caretakers either weren't meeting their actual physical needs, um, or maybe their physical needs were being met, but emotional, intellectual needs weren't. And so this person learned early on, I can't really rely and depend on others. I have to become self-reliant on myself. That was redundant, but <laughs> so this person in adulthood, they tend to be more independent and self-reliant and more of the lone wolf. They usually are uncomfortable with intimacy and closeness, and so their anxiety will rise as their partner tries to create more intimacy and closeness, whether that's emotional or physical or sexual. Um, they will usually leave, avoid, or shut down during conflicts. And you'll hear them say, like, I don't need you. I can take care of myself, right? I don't need anybody. However, even though that sounds like very lone wolf, um, people in attachment, in avoidant or dismissive attachment, they do, all of these styles do want love and they do enter relationships. So the next one would be anxious and preoccupied. And so this person will usually have more of a negative view of themselves and a positive view of the other. And so a lot, if they actually came from more of an anxious insecure childhood experiences had a lot to do with having a parent that was unpredictable. They might have been really present and attuned to you in one moment and then they weren't um, other times and so it was confusing and so as the child is trying to stabilize a bond with the caretaker they wind up putting their sense of self out into the other and trying to figure out but wait you loved me then do you still love me now and it can be really destabilizing. So this person usually has a more negative view of themselves and a more positive view of their partner. They see themselves maybe not as worthy of being loved or their partner is so amazing, so, you know, I don't know if I'm valuable enough, those kind of things. And usually they tend to put their sense of self in their partner, which is that's why it can cause so much anxiety. Because if your sense of self isn't in you but is put into your partner, you're at the whim of every move they make. Right? And your sense of self and your sense of value and your sense of love is at the mercy of what someone else is doing. Right, So they tend to show up as more dependent. They tend to really f have that fear of separateness. Their anxiety will rise as you're saying goodbye or getting off the phone. There'll be these emotional highs and lows because they're really hyper-tuned in to their partner more so than themselves. And there can be a very strong desire for closeness, but then they don't fully trust it because they don't know, you know, there's this expectation that you're going to leave me, you're going to let me down, you don't really love me, eventually the shoe is going to drop. So they'll say things like, my partner will let me down or they'll leave me. So the last one is fearful disorganized, and this is usually in cases where there has been um, a history of trauma in some form, whether that was, you know, in childhood or adulthood. And this is not as common as the other ones, but this person will tend to have a negative view of themselves as well as their partner. 
So they will see closeness and then they avoid it. As Diane Poole Heller says, this partner sort of has one foot on the gas, right, where they want to attach and bond and have closeness, but then there's one foot on the brake um, where the defense system is up. And that usually comes from experiences where someone that we have been close to or dependent on, whether that was a caretaker in childhood um, or a partner in our adulthood, they become threatening and scary and dangerous to us. So both that attachment system that wants to connect is activated as well simultaneously as with the protective defense, fight, flight, freeze, defense mechanism is up. So this person can really fear making connections. Um, they could be self-harming or abusive. And you'll usually hear things like, there's something wrong with me and you. There's this idea of, I'm broken, you're broken, we're broken. And so what I see in poly relationships is that Monogamy can be a stand-in for secure attachment. So the structure of monogamy is so strong and so stable, um, both within a relationship usually and then within the culture that reinforces it, that you can just lean in on the structure of monogamy itself to experience that safety and security, that sense of secure attachment with somebody. But what I've seen then is sometimes people then lift up the structure of monogamy and that will then expose an insecure attachment style that they didn't necessarily even know that they had. So as they do this paradigm shift, the shift itself is exposing insecurity that wasn't necessarily known before. And so it can be really difficult to go through that experience, as well as that you might now have different attachment styles with different partners. So in monogamy, even if we're dealing with an insecure attachment style, we're usually only having to deal with one attachment style at a time. Um, but in non-monogamy in poly, you're potentially experiencing different attachment styles with different partners. And some of them may be completely new, ones that you didn't actually experience before. So it can be difficult of how do I traverse this? How do I experience all these different sensations um, and attachment styles in my own body and nervous system? And how to go through that with multiple partners all at once. And so lastly, also, how do we then create secure functioning in non-monogamous relationships? And this is going to be one of my talks next year because it's become a really important part of my professional work and my personal work of how do I do these multiple relationships and how do I actually create secure functioning with someone that I don't live with? Because what happens is the majority, if not all, of the research on secure relationships in adulthood is done on monogamous couples. And so a lot of the advice and the resources out there on how to heal insecure attachments and how to create secure functioning heavily rely on monogamous behaviors, <laughs> heavily rely on hierarchical relationships, um, hierarchical relationship patterns and behaviors. So it can leave us non-monogamous folks as being like, well, I don't do a lot of those things and I'm not going to do a lot of those things or I can't do a lot of those things. Um, so how do I then create secure functioning with somebody, right? If I'm not participating in a hierarchical relationship structure with them or I don't live with them, they're not necessarily a nesting partner that I can rely on that structure with. Um, so this is something that I will be sort of focusing on in the future because um, I think we need to translate. There is some really wonderful research out there of how you do create secure, safe relationships with people. Um, but then how do we do that when we're in a structured relationship that is inherently insecure? And it is um, because we can't rely on the monogamous structure. And so it is possible. Um, it is happening out there. And that will be what I share with you all next. Um, so if we were in person, of course, we would jump into questions, but you are welcome to reach out to me. You can email me. My email is info at jessicaferncooley.com. You can check out my website at jessicaferncooley.com. Um, I would love to hear from you. Any questions, comments, feedback that you have, um, any stories that you have that even relate um, to these different things that I'm talking about with the paradigm shift. And then I also have a talk that is how to rewire your triggers, and it's sort of a beginning look at how do we work through our reactivity and shift more into responsiveness. And so that is on my website as well.
All right. Thank you for taking the time to watch and listen to this presentation today. Again, I would love to hear from you, and I do wish all of you success um, on your journey with non-monogamy in Poly.